and we're live. So welcome to this afternoon's e-memoir session in association with the Centis and the Learning Curve Group. Today's webinar is going to be led by Bees Catch Marchik, and we're looking at making the best of your advanced learning loans facility. Implications for marketing, curriculum planning and delivery. We like to keep the sessions as interactive as possible, so please feel free to use the question or chat facility at any time throughout this webinar. I'll be monitoring uh, the questions which are coming in and uh, we'll make sure that we try our best to cover everything off. If we can't answer it right away, we'll take it away with us and uh, we'll be happy to continue a dialogue. Uh, if you're watching this on the video recording, uh, welcome. If you have any questions uh, also, you'll be able to find our contact details at the end of the webinar. And again, I'd encourage you to get in contact with us and encourage you to share this webinar, webinar recording with your colleagues and your team. It provokes any discussion using team meetings and the like. And as I say, always come back to us because we're happy to help. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Beige. Thanks, Beige. Thanks very much, Manik, uh, and good uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's just after a few minutes after uh, after midday, and welcome to this uh, webinar uh, featuring and looking at different aspects of the advanced learner loans and how best to use your facility. Uh, thanks again to Ascentis uh, for sponsoring today in association with Learning Curve Group, and obviously I'm here representing eMemoir and Learning Curve Group today, also as a, a governor of a, a medium-sized college and also as a director of another uh, private training provider. And with that experience, actually, I think it helps not only to advise and consult with different providers on how best to use the facility, I actually put it into practice in the organisations that I'm actually associated with. Over the next uh, 50 to 55 minutes, we're going to look at some of the issues raised by advanced learner loans, in particular uh, issues to do with uh, providers not being able to use up the whole of their facility, even though that is available to them. Some of the issues around the delivery of programmes, in particular quality assurance of the programmes being delivered to loan funded learners. And obviously, I want to look at some of the branding and marketing issues around effective uh, uh, marketing of your uh, programs, which can be funded in a variety of ways, including through advanced learner loans. As I said, over the next uh, 50, 55 minutes, we'll cover that. If we can't answer any of your questions during the course of the webinar, we'll make our best endeavours to do so at the end. And for those of you listening in in the recordings, as Manik has said, if those questions that you might have posed are not ones that were posed in the course of the webinar, please uh, use our contact details at the very end to get in touch with us. So what I want to do, uh, as I said, is, is focus a little bit on the opportunities provided for this way of funding activity for, for people aged 19 and over who want to do a range of, of uh, vocational, technical, professional qualifications, including, of course, A-levels, but at levels three to six. I think the important thing here is that the reason that uh, advanced learner loans were introduced was partly to remove some of the barriers that even finding a 50% of a fee uh, entailed for the actual adult learner, as well as, of course, getting people to invest personally in their own learning, particularly at levels three and above, which tend to bring financial benefits to the learner in terms of future earnings. But also, I think, and this is something we, we must bear in mind, isn't just about improving my future earnings or my position in the labour market or getting promoted. There's a lot of adults that have chosen to do this for personal development reasons, for self-esteem, and for in some cases, for social reasons as well. But I think the link between uh, investing in level three and above skills, particularly the higher technical skills, is very important for the country's drive to improve skill levels, productivity, and therefore economic performance. And that was the logic behind it. So you can see that this is part of the government drive to get individual learners. It's part of what I'd call the devolved model. The devolved model is not only about devol devolving uh, adult education budget to local commissioners, combined authorities, uh, LEPs, etc., as well as obviously devolving decision-making about apprenticeships to levy and non-levy paying employers. Loans fit in very much into this devolution of making individuals responsible for their own education and training and taking some of the financial risk. I think, as we said, it was partly to also remove the barrier to many adults who would not have been entitled to be fully funded, 
uh, through, for example, the first level three entitlement if they were 19 to 24, or of course, if they're unemployed. But to remove that barrier of having to find 50% of the cost of a programme upfront or instalments. And I think the key thing here is that this focus now is which was originally on adults aged 24 and over, has now been extended to adults aged 19 and over. And that obviously has meant that in some cases, the market has changed. For example, we've now got 19 to 23 years applying for loans, but also I think created some other issues that we'll, we'll pick up when it comes to the market for, for loan funded provision. Key thing here to note, of course, is that the loan does not take account of the ability of the person in terms of their means, their current means, it's not means tested. Clearly, obviously, repayment does depend on what the person earns in future. And of course, they're available only for those qualifications. And we've already had a question uh, from one of you is just seeking to become uh, a provider that can, uh, uh, whose learners can apply for loans, is that yes, the, the, the qualifications must be approved. Um, and that you can see what is uh, approved at levels three to six on the hub, um, or if you go the the uh, most recent version of the advanced learner loans catalog, which is still being issued periodically by the ESFA, which does give you a list of all of the aims which are approved to be funded by a loan. One point to note, uh, and again, just as something just to remind yourself in the in the nitty gritty of of loans, is that when you uh, apply a fee to a, a program, whether it be a level three diploma or certificate or something at level four, that fee that you charge must include all of the direct costs involved in securing that learning aim. So not only the teaching, uh, learning and assessment costs, but any other costs which are absolutely critical for the person to achieve the learning aim. The fee must cover that and the loan must cover that. So if you've got any extra, extra activities which are not a necessary requirement, a mandatory requirement to achieve the learning aim, they can be charged for, and obviously that depends on the ability of the person, although you might use your own funds to subsidise them. For example, uh, residential costs, trips, and things like that. One thing also to note is, although originally advanced learner loans at uh, 24 and over were available to apprentices, that no longer applies. And obviously we've got a very different funding methodology now for apprenticeships. So that was some of the background to loans. One of the things I wanted to, to just talk about before we, we start looking at the, the, the rules and conditions and how we can use those to maximise the funding from uh, loan funded activity is just a couple of points about the volume of loan funded activity. And this, I think, sets the context for making best use of your facility. And I'm going to ask you uh, in a few moments how much of your facility it looks like you're going to be able to use up based on current data. But what is clear is that since uh, advanced learner loans were introduced in 2013, there's been a, a, a significant underspend of almost a billion pounds. So that's obviously uh, meant that a lot of the facility, and the facility, don't forget, is coming from uh, government-backed uh, and sponsored uh, loans uh, through the student loans company. And therefore, if we don't use up the facility, that money is then obviously lost to you. Secondly, subcontracting. Now, if you look at the some of the growth in uh, uh, learners taking out loans, a significant amount of that growth was uh, coming from subcontracted provision. Well, that's not been permitted since the beginning of August 2017. In other words, any subcontracting, any subcontracting had to finish by the 31st of July of last year. Now, I know that we've had several questions about whether this might be reversed in future because there might, that might have accounted for perhaps some of the falls in, in numbers of learners, but also, uh, you know, what the implications are that if you've got, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, waiting lists, for example, or if you've not been able to uh, uh, get on to the uh, register in your own right to become uh, a provider. I think that's partly because there was a, a quite a significant shift, if you want, uh, and I'll come back to this at a later point, but initially it was the FE college sector that uh, had the biggest share of the loans market. Now that's changed, that's in fact uh, almost reversed now with private providers increasing their share of the loans market, which does raise issues about why have they been able to do that, and I'll come to look at that under things like marketing and models of delivery. But I think generally there was a feeling that there was a, it was easy to access the loans market, uh, particularly for first-time uh, 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 providers, 
and that meant there were some issues about quality assurance and uh, whether there were some uh, what do you call uh, um, uh, unforeseen impacts of that uh, reasonably easy entry. There has therefore uh, been some concern that just at the same time as that uh, the market has become more difficult to enter and subcontracting has no, is no longer allowed, um, that there's actually been a fall in the take-up of loans, particularly with the 24 and over. Uh, and obviously the group that has taken most advantage was the, the extended group, uh, the 19 to 23s. What is also noticeable, if you look at the data that's collected on who funds their level three and above programs for loans, there has been poor take up from learners from disadvantaged communities, whether it be disadvantaged by postal code, by economic conditions, or by other measures of social deprivation. And there's also been a reluctance in, in some uh, communities um, uh, to, 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 to take out loans. So with this in mind, and then the obvious cap on growth requests, and just to make you aware, those of you that are thinking of making a, a growth request to increase your loans facility, the next opening is the 23rd of March, the 6th of April. I'll come back to that later on. Um, what has also been a noticeable aspect of the loans funded market is that uh, 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 most of it, uh, well in excess of 85, 90% of the provision has been at level three. And of course, the original idea was very much about uh, getting uh, uh, adults to invest in the higher skills uh, to undertake training, particularly at levels four to six, where the greatest improvements in productivity are. But however, one point to note, not just not looking at loan funded activity, if you look at the level three entitlements, and co-funded activity, actually the number of adults uh, since uh, has fallen at level three since 2013 anyway. So that would have been a, a, a consequence, not necessarily a consequence of loans, it was gonna happen in the market anywhere. Um, so I think this is, this is uh, it's, it's creating all kinds of issues and problems. And, and obviously the, the, the funding rules stating that subcontracting, which can include using self-employed staff, uh, would be uh, in effect uh, an issue uh, is that uh, when we look at uh, the, the new arrangements which some of you maybe have taken uh, uh, advantage of uh, once subcontracting was terminated that really has to be tested with the ESFA or tested uh, certainly from a legal point of view uh, and certainly with auditors to make sure that it uh, is consistent with the current rules and I'll, I'll come back to that later but it's a question that we've already uh, been posed. So what are the rules that relate to the current year? And obviously we're waiting for 2018-19 for and that, that will become available soon. Is that first of all, in this current year, the learner eligibility was extended to members of the armed forces while they were abroad, particularly those that are studying by distance. They're now able to access a loan and that's obviously increased the market. Uh, a, a change that was introduced in the last few years was to allow those people doing technical and professional qualifications to increase the uh, number of loans they can take out either consecutively or concurrently to uh, uh, up to four. This is always applied to A levels, by the way. Uh, but of course, if you're willing to, if you're going to undertake an access course, you can only have one loan for one access course. In other words, if you want to do two access courses, one after the other, whatever, you would only be able to uh, access a loan for one of them. But there are other advantages, as we'll see later on, with uh, access to HE. One point to note, and this is just a, a, a key aspect in terms of your uh, way in which you promote loans is once the learner has decided that they want to undertake a level three and above program, and then you say, well, the fee is so-and-so, and they say, right, well, how can I pay the fee if they're not in a position to pay it through uh, 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 cash themselves, or if they're not one of the statutory entitled groups, then you point them in a the direction of taking out a, 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 a loan. I think it's important that you, you, you do make it clear to the learner that if they are eligible under the 19 to 23 statutory entitlement to the first full level three, and obviously that's, you know, you've got to make sure the qualification is one which is a first full level three, then obviously you would direct them to be fully funded and that would come to you through your AEB funding if you're already uh, 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 directly funded for AB. If you're a subcontractor, then obviously that would be a relationship between you and the prime. 
If a learner aged 19 to 23 chooses to apply for a loan rather than exercise the legal entitlement to full funding for first full level three, you must make them aware that this means they've given up the right. And even if they might be wanting to exercise that right later on, certainly up until the point which they uh, are still 23, then they've got to know what the consequences are that that right no longer applies. So just make sure you're, you, you, you remind yourselves of that. Uh, also, um, there has been a little bit of concern that uh, providers maybe have not just directed uh, learners to uh, 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 the loans uh, application process. They've actually helped them to complete it or actually said that they must do, take a, a loan to, to, to go on this programme. That isn't obviously uh, permitted and that is something I just want to remind you about. Um, you've all, one of you has already asked about the which qualifications are eligible for loans. They are on the hub or the Advanced Learner Loans Qualifications Catalogue. Just put that into Google or uh, go into the ESFA and you'll be uh, directed to it. Now, one very important uh, uh, advantage to access of H to HE programmes, I know it's, those are QAA approved programmes, is that if you successfully complete uh, an HE programme later on, say, uh, uh, you know, uh, a higher uh, uh, diploma, uh, BA or whatever, or a foundation degree, then your access to HE loan, say for £3,000 or whatever it is, would then be written off. This only applies to access to HE and to another qualifications. Obviously, that um, has to take account of the fact that if you take a, a loan for an access to HE course, you can't then have a second loan for another access to HE uh, course. Now, the other thing to note, by the way, is there's a bit of confusion about the loans bursary fund, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, and the learning and learner support that you might get if you're already uh, and also securing uh, funding, a funding uh, uh, allocation or contract through the adult education budget. They're, they're ring fenced and they've got to be kept quite separate, and that clearly will be picked up by any audit auditors. Um, the other question about how much uh, the loan can be for, the loan must never exceed whatever is the funding rate in the hub. In other words, the listed rate for that particular level three to six qualification. So the fee has got to be therefore recognised as being one which is either less than the uh, loan funded rate, the learning aims rate. It can be the same as the learning aims rate. And I would suggest from past uh, webinars, the majority of you think that uh, that's where you set your fee, or in rare occasions, although it's not uh, not to be, uh, it's not desirable, um, the fee might actually exceed what's in the learning aims rate, in which case the loan cannot exceed what's in the learning aims rate, and I'll come back to that in a minute. One key thing in terms of earnings, and once the the learner has passed the two-week mark, they become eligible for the loan, and you obviously will receive payments from the student loans company, is that 100% uh, of the payments, which of course are depending on the monthly profile, the difference between the start date and end date for that individual learner, it's 100% on retention. There is no achievement uh, element. It's very much unlike the adult education budget, where 80% of your funding is uh, on program retention. And this 20% is for achievement of whatever the qualification is. Uh, the key thing about the, the issue about the learner choosing, the learner should obviously have all the information about the, the, the provider and all of the information about the program uh, before they actually submit their application for a loan. Now, if for any reason they want to change that before they actually undertake the learning, that is okay. But obviously, um, uh, what we're suggesting here is that the learner has made the decision to learn first, and that includes making a decision about which provider they're going to learn with and what is the actual nature of the programme they're going to uh, uh, undertake. Now, obviously, that... Uh, that is something about how you share that information, and I'll come back to that later on, Lorraine. Um, if a learner withdraws, and let's assume this isn't a break in learning, if it's a withdrawal, they no longer want to complete the programme, then obviously payments stop at that point, and that's obviously done through the, the reconciliation process. Uh, so 
just just be aware obviously that um, your funding in terms of the student loans company uh, depends very much on how successful you are at retaining that learner and that's obviously part of your marketing strategy to retain them part of your uh, the way in which you deliver the program and obviously something which inspectors will also be looking at in terms of uh, retention and success and achievement. So for example, let's just assume that we're using a, a, an census uh, access to HE diploma, it's weighted at A, so in the learning aims rate in the hub, it's £3,022, it's a one-year program. I would suggest that case study two is where most of you as providers are, because you would tend to set the, uh, the fee at that rate. The learner knows what the fee is, and that's inclusive of cost of assessment, and therefore they would apply for a loan for 3022 as long as that access to each each course was uh, eligible and uh, and then obviously that 3022 would be spread over the number of months and equal payments to you from the student loans company depending on uh, uh, retention now you might decide to try uh, uh, to look at case situation 1 where you might say well we're in a very competitive position for those access to HE diplomas, there's a lot of competition. Let's put the fee down to 2,800. In that case, the loan would be for 2,800 because that's the fee that you're charging and that would then be spread over the, the months that you plan that program for. Case study three, well, it, it, it's not desirable. I've seen it once where the provider for exclusivity to ration the, the market, um, maybe for added value that might be put on, actually charges a fee above the learning aims rate. The, that is, that's your decision, that's your choice. The loan that the learner can take, however, cannot exceed the learning aims rate in the hub or the LARS, the learning aims rate system, and therefore uh, that would be 3,022. In this case, the provider might be asking the learner to make a, an initial contribution of 178 pounds to the cost of the course. It could be for some uh, added value, for some additional points, or simply as a way of recognizing that it wants to ration the market in, in some way. So these are, are possibilities. Now again, just from a show of hands, from those of you listening in, how many of you generally have tended to set your fees for your level three and above programs at the learning aims rate, uh, which is on the LARS or the hub? So that's case study two. So in this case, in this case, if this was a, a, an access to HE diploma from a sentence weighted at A, you'd be setting the fee at 3,022. Just to show fans then, how many have tended to use the LARS, the learning aims rate, uh, as, the, as the rate for the fee? And just show of hands. Yeah, we've got a fair number of hands going up there, Marek. Yeah, looking. Choosing. It looks like it's over. Choosing. Uh, yeah, over about halfway at the moment there. Yeah, and I think that that, that again, it, it's 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 part and parcel of the process of making sure that the offer that you're making is attractive and fee can be. Uh, uh, a determinant of uh, demand, particularly if it's uh, if you're asking people to make a contribution or if they are, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, looking to pay it in full as a full cost recovery of program. Um, are you able to request the law of income, the loss of income for those learners that withdraw? The answer is, Adrian, is no, because in effect, they, you, the, if the person's withdrawn, you're no longer making the provision to them. And therefore, the assumption is that the student loans company will now know that the person's got a liability to them. That's the individual learner. And they will obviously pursue that with the individual learner. Remember, the learner becomes eligible to repay the loan once they, uh, they've passed the, the two-week point. Um, if, if we've got any issues there about uh, people not uh, completing the program. The program it assumes that completion is going to be through uh, through retention and therefore there's not a separate achievement element but clearly that will then feature in your uh, QAR and then obviously what is then reported for inspection. Um, if you've got, uh, if you're using LARS as a, as a guide 
but you can sometimes put together different combinations because of course you might have a loan funded learners are also using uh, doing programs maybe at a different level for example at level two they might be doing a GCSE in which case you would find that the GCSE is fully funded anyway uh, or the functional skills and then they would be taking out a loan so it's possible to have learners the same adult actually funded from different sources for different aspects of the total program uh, we've got a question from Paul Murphy. If a learner has their work passed by an internal quality assurance by re but, but rejected by the external quality assurance and now does not want to do any more work, withdraws, do they still have to repay the loan? Well, the, the issue there is that they will not be, they will not have completed the program. So they would be perceived to be a, a withdrawal, in which case they would have to repay the loan. Uh, I, I would have to Paul, look at the specifics of why that has happened, but quite clearly it does, and when we come to the learner journey, it does say complete and achieve. So we'll have to look at that. We'll look at that in a second. So in terms of some of the, what I'd call logistics, and this relates to what Paul's asked actually does relate to, to this next point. There are actually five key stages in the learner journey, and this is obviously key in, in terms of how you engage the adult learner, and obviously it reflects also how effective you are in uh, marketing to that learner, and then obviously in the quality of the provision that you're making. So as we know, the start of the formal interaction between you, so this goes back to the question about, do we have to, do, does the learner have to have a provider? Yes, they do, because that's one of the key parts of that letter. The learner application then is the learner applies for the loan, the initial liability point, as I said, is after two weeks. The first loans payment is then made to you, but the lender then becomes liable for the loan at that point. Now, obviously, once they've passed the initial point, you've got to confirm their attendance using the student loans company portal, and then you get the payments back on behalf of the learner. Now, the last part of the journey is completion and achievement. It goes back to Paul's question. When a learner's completed the learning in line with the learning agreement with you, that's the last part of the journey. And what I would say is the person has not necessarily completed that uh, part of the journey, even though there's not a, a, a proportion of the actual loan that's directly attributed to uh, the achievement element. However, what I would like to say is if the, um, if the uh, learner's got a, a reason for saying I'm not comfortable with that assessment, uh, the EQA, and that might then be an appeal, then I would assume that that would have to be heard first before any decision was made about whether they were still going to be liable for the whole of the loan or whatever. There's a question about, is it correct that the repayment alone would only be when a lender is earning over 25,000 pounds? That, that's, the, that's the proposed change, that this also reflects what's happening in HE, that uh, the, um, the threshold for repaying a loan will be increased in future from 21,000 to 25,000. Now, originally it was proposed to do that in 2020. Uh, I'm still waiting for confirmation that uh, that's, if that's going to be uh, different uh, next year, that's 18, 19. Um, so how you're actually paid, it reflects exactly what those, those questions have related to. Let's just say that we've charged the learner 2,800 for that access to HE diploma. We'd be then earning that in seven payments of 400 pounds. Now, obviously, if the learner has got a break in learning, say of a couple of weeks, and that's because of illness, whatever, you'd make the judgment as to whether they can continue in the program or you might send them work, whatever. But obviously, if, the, if, it's, if it's a longer break in learning, that's got to be accounted for for. You don't want the person to be using up the loan and obviously then uh, worry about them not uh, taking up the facility. Um, now, uh, and in fact, we've got a question. If I have a loan learner's come on a break of learning due to pregnancy, however, the course has moved on the learner and program, does it make sense that they can transfer the loan to the next? Yes, there is. You, you can do that, Sally, because you've got good reason to say that that person has not had the opportunity to take up all the benefits of the loan. The problem with this is that obviously you're waiting to know what your loans facility is going to be in uh, from next August. Is and, and I think increasingly the student loans company is operating on the on not on the basis of the sort of uh, academic year or even the financial year. In effect, it's operating on the on, on the basis of the student 
year whenever that student starts so obviously the, the you know if you've got a seven month program that program month one could have been may and then month seven could have been uh, for example december so that you know you are going to cross uh, financial and uh, academic years and, and obviously when you make growth requests you can obviously ask for a different uh, split uh, from what is normally the the uh, financial year so I think one of the key things about this is 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 to look very carefully at this individual situation that that learner's in and make that judgment as to whether it would be better for them to to uh, uh, to stop the program not continue with the program wait till that person then comes back and start the next course with them and then obviously make sure that uh, that they, they can take advantage of uh, the loan in the next uh, in the next uh, period of time whether that be an academic year or financial year it makes no difference so hopefully that that uh, that assures you that uh, that's okay by the way looking at look at the look at again look at the guidance notes on um, best practice in terms of supporting the learners if they have breaks in learning uh, the other thing, of course, to note is that when you've got learners taking out more than one loan, either consecutively or concurrently, each one of those is treated quite in separately and will have separate conditions applied to it. So you can have different start dates for them. You can have different, you can even have breaks in learning from one, but not another. All of this has also got to be factored in. The other point to note, and again, we've had a couple of questions about how we can support learners who take out loans if they've got any uh, uh, learning difficulties or any other uh, 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 financial difficulties or childcare requirements. When you make an application for, uh, to, for a loans facility, at the same time, you can also apply for particularly if it's the first time through the uh, register of training organizations you can or through a direct entry point to to obviously have a loans bursary fund now remember the loans bursary fund is not to support the cost of the delivery of teaching learning and assessment it's all those attendant costs that might stop that person completing the program or even taking part in the program so this is not an entitlement because once you've made uh, uh, provision for a loans bursary that you decide how to distribute it to your individual learners now it can cover a range of costs uh, not only in learning support if they've got for example literacy numeracy dyslexia or whatever whatever individual need but also in terms of learner support so it covers things like hardship child care cost of books etc but also it takes account of the differences between loans uh, uh, loan funded learners in one part of the country or another through the area cost uplifts and bear that in mind. Now for those of you who are uh, uh, contracted as opposed to grant funded, so for example independent training providers, there are basically three rates of support. You've got to decide which rate is most applicable to that learner. You then claim uh, 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 you can then uh, use that, that you, sorry, you can from your loans bursary then expend either 50, 150 or 250 pounds per month for that learner depending on what their degree of need is. So if they've got uh, 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 childcare needs in learning and, and support needs then you might be uh, putting using the highest of those costs, the 250 pounds per month for as many months as that is required. There might be that in other months the childcare needs are not there and you might only be looking at in learning support needs which would be 150 pounds or whatever it is uh, it might be different in each month now if you're a grant and by the way that's got to be done based on actual cost in in uh, you know a month uh, in arrears those of you who are grant funded you will be able to claim 150 pounds per month for any learner who's got learning support needs once you've recognized those needs and assessed them Anything else, such as childcare or hardship or, or whatever, additional cost of books, etc., or anything else that the person needs to be able to complete the program, which is not covered by the cost of the actual loan, you will have to keep data in terms of the cash value. And, and I'll explain how, the, how those, uh, the, the learner support fund is being managed in, in, in a few moments. Just taking account of a, a couple of other questions in the meantime. Thanks very much. Sheila's asking a question. Uh, you're a provider and you've got a loans facility in your own right. Yeah, yeah. You're not working as a partner. Remember, you cannot as a subcontractor. So, 
okay. If you've got learners who are waiting to do levels three to five, and you're going to meet their needs by using self-employed assessors. Going back, Sheila, to the, the thing about, um, about the subcontracting uh, uh, rules and what counts as subcontracting and what doesn't, the, the advice, again, is, is if, you're, if you're willing to wait to the end of the, the programme, is to say that it's best to test this out with auditors. I would, I, we've certainly gone to, to, to get legal advice as well as have the conversation with the ESFA about whether this model would actually constitute um, a form of partnership working, which would, by definition, still be considered to be subcontracting. So we'd want to make sure you, you had that really tested, out and then obviously come back to that specifically at the very end of this session. Um, the other thing to note about learning support are not enough. Say the £150 you want to claim in a month to support that person is not enough. And it's, and, you, and obviously it's coming out of your loans uh, bursary fund facility. Is You can obviously use the earnings adjustment statement to put to record any funding above the £150 in any month. And I think that's just, uh, so you're, you're using that to show anything where the, the, the fixed monthly rate is not enough. Now, those of you who are grant funded, remember you actually receive your bursary allocation, whatever. In April, everyone else that, You, you put in the ILR that shows any in detail the amount of bursary used. And obviously, one point to note when you're making a growth request to increase maybe your loans facility. I'll just go back over that because I think we lost it for a minute. Um, if you're wanting to make a, 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 a claim or a growth request to increase the amount of loans facility, and as I said, the next one of those points is the 23rd of March, the 6th of April, you can also do that if you want to change or increase your loans bursary fund. And those uh, documents are obviously available on the ESFA website. The three funding claims to detail the amount of bursary used applies to all of you. There's a mid-year point, the end year point, and obviously uh, the final claim point. So just to make sure you understand that great grant funded, and I, some of you listening in are grant funded, you receive your bursary allocation in three, that's the August, the January, and April. For all the rest of it, it's based uh, on the ILR data that we submit each month. Okay, so what about the demand for loans? You know, once we get around the technical side, the big issue, of course, is this, that you can have, obviously, you know, you've got to be consistent with the rules. But what's happened generally? The demand for loans, and this is the number of loan applications received, has gone up steadily. But of course, a big factor that affected 16, 17, and I'm sure it's going to affect 17, 18, will be the, the large number of 19 to 23 year olds who weren't previously able to apply for loans will now do so. But the reality is that despite this, you know, as I said, almost a billion pounds of underspend on the loans facility is that even in government policy costings in the blue book, when the government announced the increase in the loans facility up to 2020, it identified this as very high uncertainty rating. In other words, there was an assumption that even though the facility was available, and even though the rules have obviously created some issues and problems, that we'd have been able to exploit this new source of funding to increase the number of learners. As I said, the other issue was that the loans facility was very much to increase the skills levels of the population. It has been mostly at level three. Now, that in itself helps, but what we really wanted to see was more at level four to six. It also, when you start to look at the distribution of programs undertaken, you can see that health, public services, care, education and training and business and admin have really done well out of it. And obviously sitting in there was the resources. What has become clear, and you know, even even today we, we you know we we've identified that you know there are some complications in the actual uh, management of the 
acceptance, uh, how many learners understand the information that's available to them, and the benefits that they can uh, get from learning and from taking out a loan. There are certainly negative perceptions by some parts of the community of the loans, uh, taking out credit, etc., and some similar issues in terms of uh, uh, particularly for those learners that uh, might have other demands on their time and their, their uh, money. I think the, the, the big issue for, for us, and I know that two of you have already posed this question, is that if we, the ending of subcontracting, and subcontractors working with a prime, we're often very good at activating the market, at engaging with learners, and often very good at delivering in a more flexible, responsive way. I think that's definitely had an impact on participation. Now, the question that a couple of you have asked me in advance is, is there any chance of that being allowed again if we have particularly large waiting lists? Well, that information is critical. First of all, we are already, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the case of, of two of the, the companies I'm associated with, we've exceeded our, our, our loans facility already and we are making growth requests. And our regrowth, growth requests are, in some cases, for more than the £250,000 that uh, uh, we're being set as a limit because we've got evidence of, say, three or 400 learners. And that would uh, certainly require us to show that we've got not only the demand, but the capacity and capability to deliver, and certainly the quality assurance in place to make sure. So I would think that the more opportunities we have to tell the funding agencies that, uh, that we have got waiting lists, and at the moment it seems also uh, uh, perverse that uh, if I have a waiting list of 400 learners to do beauty and complementary uh, studies, I have to sort of, if you, in effect, hand their names over to a careers company or an information system for then, then to be uh, given to other providers that haven't used up the facility, doesn't actually recognise the, 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 the work we've done to market and uh, increase the demand for, for learning. I think on the other side, so my general feeling is that it, 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 I think subcontracting in itself is getting tighter. The rules are certainly tightening. Uh, we certainly are aware of working with one uh, pro, um, provider where they had a, an interpretation of their new partnership agreement, uh, which is not subcontracting, uh, uh, agreed by the ESFA, by auditors and by uh, legal experts, that there are some opportunities to do that. And obviously, if you want any advice on that, we can do so at the end of this session. Um, I think there's obviously some uh, parts of the market which have not been deterred. The reality is that learners there have continued to take up the opportunities to learn. Access to HE was one classic example, but access to HE numbers have fallen this year, and I think that's for other reasons, mostly what's going on in HE and an alternative offer from higher education institutions, and also because many learners who took out loans either were not intending to, to stay in the labour market or return to the labour market and didn't expect to earn over 21,000. Obviously, that might be different when uh, it's over 25,000, we might actually see uh, some further take up. But that's something we've got to see, it's a sensitivity. Uh, and I think there's not only a price sensitivity, there's also an income sensitivity around taking out loans. So what are the implications then? So if we know what the, the current market situation is, we've got an underspend on loans facility, there are some issues around subcontracting, removing some, uh, some good quality provision, then what can we do to, uh, to make the best of our loans facility? Well, my first question really is, have you got a, a clear position in the market? Have you got a clear brand proposal, which says that, um, you know, whatever your perception, expectations are learning, we're gonna meet them and exceed them. The key thing here is, it's not the loan that does this. It's the desire to take, out, to, to take up some learning. In other words, how do you attract the learner to take up learning in the first place? And then how to get them to fund it is the second set of decisions. Your data should tell you quite a lot of information about current patterns of recruitment and participation by different types of learners, whether you break it down by, by postal codes, by uh, socioeconomic groups, by gender, whatever. But clearly, if you're doing well at, at attracting, uh, say, uh, women returners to learning, then that might say that you're doing certain things right why isn't that not working with, say, uh, men or other parts of the community? So I think what really has shown 
and I think the more successful providers is that they've had a different engagement strategy for each community with a different set of brand values. It's just the tone that you might use with those people who are seeking personal development and career development as opposed to those who are seeking, uh, for example, social interaction and a chance to get back into learning. I think using the, the information in career services has helped, but that's not been the primary source of information. Certainly in our testing of the market, it's our website and our offer, our websites and offers, that's been a much greater factor, as well as the outreach we've done through things like working with learners on level one and two programs. In fact, a, a fair number of our uh, learners have progressed from the level two entitlements uh, to do level three loan funded provision when they've been older. Um, I think the other thing is, is to look at what determines uh, the retention, because this is just as much. The, the, the learners that retained often then go and tell other learners about how good the learning was, this return to learning was successful. And therefore, the more we spend looking at the learner journey and the time we spend on that and people's feelings, the better. I don't think uh, the, the fee itself has been a, a poorer offer of, of potential learners. What has been attractive is the enhancements. Um, for example, free or low price offers. I mean, we've, you know, we've, we've certainly talked about using Groupon and Voucher to get learners in in the first place. Some of those courses have been free. Some have been quite low priced offers. And then once we've got the learners in on a one or two day short course, we've introduced them to a longer offer, say a level three certificate diploma, and that seems to have worked well. For me, the most important aspect of, of making the best of your, your, your loans facility is, have you got a clear offer? Is that offer being one which is regularly offered, put on? For example, if all of your offer is on in September, October, you're not gonna use up your, learn, your, your loans facility. Adults don't behave that way. They're looking for opportunities that might fit with say a January start or an Easter start, for example, we found that quite a lot of people wouldn't come to our evening provision until the nights got lighter. So obviously that's better in spring and summer. So, you know, we, we can take advantage of others wanted to take advantage of extended breaks uh, from work or whatever. So the key thing for us here is that the, the, the learners have got to be uh, uh, understood and the needs and their choices and their drivers and motivations have got to be understood. And for us, that really means we've got to understand the individual learner journey and their experience of it. And this is the, for me, you know, the journey is critical. It's, you know, all those stages at which the person interacts where you stage. So, you know, you all understood, I think we're all fairly familiar with the concept of the learner journey, but for loan funded learners, have we actually identified the key steps in just journey? Do we know how curriculum and business support functions actually are critical for this journey to be successful? And how do we access, assess how well learners feel or they perceive about their experience of the provider and the program that you're offering? And, and I think that plotting the key stages where the brand and the customer interact are critical for us. So for example, in, in, in all of the organizations, we make repeated offers of level three and above programs across the, across across an academic and financial year. So learners can start in January and go through to the following December. Learners can start in April and go through to the following March. They can go through, they start some in April and finish by the time they get to November. We're trying to make sure it fits with lifestyle choices when they're most ready to learn. But every part of that process, from that information advice and guidance, right through to progression, is one which is constantly being tested. And that's what good teachers and good facilitators and good assessors do every time they meet uh, a, a learner all the way through that process. But we do it from their perspective, not from our perspective. Because I think if you still think of, 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 of uh, loan funded activity as a sort of August to July, uh, um, uh, if you want a uh, process, then you're not gonna use up your loans facility. And for example, we had lots and lots of adults start with us at, uh, at Learning Curve and at White Rose in January. After Christmas, lifestyle changes, want to do a bit of learning. Have we got something we can offer them at level three, a certificate, whatever, in massage, theater makeup, and it fits. We're going to do the same in April, straight after Easter. 
we might actually have different offers just over summer. So we see this as a continuous process. It's, it's therefore not looking at it in terms of academic years or not looking at it in terms of loan facilities. And the student loans company doesn't think that way. It thinks about what's, what, is the, what is that person's um, uh, ability uh, and desire and how best can the process of learning support that and then the loan will reflect that. And we even test uh, how people feel about, and we fact, particularly this with, uh, with some of our level three programs, we've, we've certainly found uh, a lot of uh, uh, issues around people's emotional uh, feelings about programs. So for example, they, they often are quite positive when they make an inquiry, there's a first level three program, I can do an access to HE course, you know, it's, a, it's access to nursing or access to business or access to teaching. They then make the application, they're interviewed, and the interview is stressful, the negative feelings there, I'm never going to be able to do this course. But obviously, they then enroll, first learning is brilliant, I've really enjoyed it, a positive feel. You're going to have someone that will use up the whole of the loan and perhaps take out a second loan because they enjoyed it so much. I've just done my level three diploma in, in, in aromatherapy. I'm now going to do a level three diploma in massage or theatre makeup or uh, exercise to music. Um, but not only that, those positive feelings then get transmitted to uh, friends, relatives, etc. And that starts to then build the momentum to use up the whole of your facility. It isn't the, the size of facility that's the issue, it's, it's the size of demand for the learning and how we can actually activate those different markets. And I can see that one or two of you are saying absolutely clear, yes, uh, we, we're trying to do this. Because what we've got then is to make sure that we already have identified where the potential markets are and who's likely to want to undertake a level three and above program. We should have some data that says that we know that there'll be a fair number of people there that will need to take out a loan who won't be in a position to take advantage of a statutory entitlement or who will be able to pay us full cost. In which case, they've got to be, it's got to be clear what the advantages of loans are over other means of payment. What are the motivations? Is it about personal development? Is it about career development? Is it about promotion? This could be, for example, a nurse who's already working, who might be wanting to undertake an evening or weekend program with you to di diversify her skill set or her, his skill set into something different. So that nurse might be, it could be a nurse that's looking at going into massage, into sports therapy, or into remedial therapy. So that's something you should, you should is absolutely critical in that engagement. And then obviously showing what the benefits are of investing in a loan, future earnings, promotions, et cetera, how it funds my continuing professional development if the employer's not willing to do it, i.e. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm employed but can take out a loan. And what's most important here is, is that every one of you that's listening in will have uh, examples of good practice and what's worked for you. If it's worked well in one area, but not another part of your provision, then find out why and obviously try and get that uh, to, to, to do it. But I think one of the key things at the moment is this isn't just about thinking about marketing in terms of publicity, promotions, etc. It's that deeper engagement with learners and how many of your existing learners would think about going on to a level three funded by a loan? What motivates them? How to activate those parts of the community that maybe have never thought of a, a level three program before? But more importantly, I think, is to make sure that you understand how they want that to be delivered. Because if you say to them, you've got to wait and start a new program, uh, particularly when there might be uh, other, other demands at that time of the year, or that uh, for that person in their personal uh, life cir circumstances, you might actually lose them. So what that, what is this has got is, is, is significant implications for the curriculum offer. Um, uh, I'm just going to, I don't know why that's happened. Yeah. Uh, Mike, can you just check whether my webcam's still up? I don't know why it's come up. Okay. So those are the sort of key questions that I think we need to pose. Now, what are the implications for curriculum planning and delivery? I think the most important thing is to make sure that you've identified who might be activated by a loan in terms of potential new markets. 
But at the same time also, what might be new products that might offer to that market, say a level three certificate delivered in a different way, delivered by blended learning, whatever. The modes of delivery and attendance are absolutely critical. What we found, certainly in, 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 in maximizing our loans facility, <clears throat> is to think of different modes of delivery and attendance. More evenings, more weekends. We certainly found more weekends, even delivering in different premises, which the learners might feel very comfortable with. For example, um, some of our massage courses are delivered in, in neighboring hotels at weekends. But to also make sure that around that, we package all the support that's needed for that adult, particularly if they're making a decision to return to learning, such as childcare, study skills, etc. And then making sure that all of that then focuses on supporting the person to stay and to achieve, and that's the appropriate use of learning support and learner support funds. So the bursary kicks in here as an active part of the uh, implication of the curriculum planning and delivery. And then to make sure that we use those partners who are best at working with us, whether they, for example, jointly teach it, uh, jointly supply the materials, et cetera, because very often what we'll do is we'll put the provision on and a different company supplies us with the teaching materials, and that really is helpful, or the distance learning materials, whatever. But the key thing here is, it's how flexible and responsible can we be to make sure we activate and retain that market. And I think working with the appropriate awarding body here as well, which obviously might advise on the best way to deliver the component parts of that qualification is, is useful as well, particularly where you might be using uh, assessment on demand or where you might be looking at things like blending that with other qualifications such as C English and Maths, Functional Skills, GCSEs. So for example, if we're talking about that um, Ascentis Level 3 diploma, the questions that we often get from learners is, can I study this in the evenings and at weekends? And if we get enough people who want to do it on that basis, and we might have three or four starts during the course of a year, then we'll do so. Can they do, do I need to always attend all the lessons? Can I do some of it by distance? Can some of it be blended? And obviously that's something that you, you have to take account of. Can we attend at a different location? As I said, we do quite a lot of programs at local hotels because they are the weekends they are less busy, they've got good car parking, and it sounds special and it's different. And you know you can rent those rooms sometimes at a cheaper rate than if you used your own facilities at the weekends in terms of opening security, et cetera. We had a big request from some of our learners to concentrate the learning around five days after Easter Monday. We'll do that. Uh, obviously, you might have attendant costs in terms of childcare costs, we put those on, but those learners really wanted to make sure that they had a, a, a really good thorough understanding of the principles of the program. Could this Qualification help me gain promotion. If it doesn't, then you know you've got you've got to be able to show some other advantages. Can it make me more productive or effective? Show that, particularly if it's uh, about accessing HE, it might mean that you've already got the study skills to be able to be more successful at HE. What can you do next? You know, it could be a whole series of things, not just HE. It could be apprenticeships, etc. And obviously, all those things that come out of it. One of the questions that we found quite interesting is working particularly in, in the area of beauty and hair, quite a lot of our learners when they qualified at level three then said, oh, I'd love to train in this area. So then they were attracted to further qualifications or I want to be an assessor in this area, which obviously helps to then secure a bit of a, a succession plan in terms of assessors and trainers. Um, and the many other questions that learners may ask before they commit. And so I think those are the sort of key things that uh, we really were trying to get over in terms of what is critical for us to, to make best use of that facility. I think in terms of the actual funding side of it, you know, I don't think uh, loan funded markets are particularly price sensitive because actually I'm taking out the loan for whatever the fee was. I think it was more important for things like full cost learners who would want to know how they pay. And certainly we found it sometimes that when we've asked some people to then go and apply for a loan to pay for the fee for a course, they've just said, it's just easier for me to pay, pay up front and they'll just do a credit card payment. Well, that's okay. Um, but I think what we then got to do is understand that when you've got people that are full cost recovery and loan funded and statutory entitlements all in the same class, or in the same group, they can have different motivations. And that's something obviously we'll have to come back to and look at uh, as, as creating different dynamics in the class, especially if they're being taught together. Um, and certainly we often find that the loan funded learners and the full cost learners are much more committed 
uh, because they've made that contribution, that commitment in terms of finance. Um, and Sheila, I share your, 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 your frustration. I know we're still getting people to, uh, to pay to come on uh, to our, uh, you know, to take it alone, sorry, and they want to join us. Um, but the, the problems we've got are, are still ones about having to, to uh, put them back into, if you want, the pot for other people to have. I know it's frustrating. Um, one other thing, by the way, to note is that obviously uh, for training providers, if we are putting on loan funded provision and we're subject to VAT, I think we've had a ruling, uh, Gavin, in the last few weeks that uh, the, the loan must include the, the, the VAT. So in other words, you can't take the 3022 model I showed you before and then add 20% on. That must include the 20%. And obviously that's frustrating because then you say 20% of that money is then being uh, the, uh, 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 um, uh, directed towards HMRC. And by the way, this applies only for those of you who are private training providers. So um, that uh, uh, is just a bit of clarification there, Gavin. Thanks very much for asking the question. Um, and I think obviously when that comes back to the sort of, if you want the hard decisions about planning and costing, um, you know, you will have mixed classes. I'm sure you, we've got them. We've got people with a level three entitlement in the same group as, as loan funded lenders, as well as full cost. Um, and there are different drivers, different motivations. When we're trying to work out whether that class is viable, we try and make sure we cover the direct cost of delivery and overhead contributions, but it can change quite quickly with a different dynamic. And here for us, the, the main driver is that if we have 18 learners on a, 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 a massage course and half of them are funded by the loan and half are funded by uh, statutory entitlements, loan funded learners, there's no achievement element. The statutory entitlements are 20% achievement element. Therefore, you know, we've, we could lose potentially up to 20%, never mind the retention funding. We know that the break even level will be around 12, 13, but you can immediately see that any just marginal change by one learner or two learners can actually have an impact on whether we can actually afford to run that program. And so therefore, we're always looking at different delivery methods, some different ways of blending learning to make sure that we retain the learners, we deliver the quality. And for us, obviously, the, the big the question is that if we're resourcing this type of provision, it is often that you see a loan funded class only. You know, the learners will be funded from different sources. So what we've got to model is, and we've tended to do this using data from the last two or three years, we look at uh, statutory funded learners, 19 to 23, loan funded learners, um, 19 over now, and obviously other adults who are funded by full cost and seen how over the last two or three years, the patterns of retention achievement to then determine what will be the, the, the break-even level. And I'm sure you've all done something similar to that. For me, the, the, the biggest driver of, of achieving and using up the facility after the markets, the marketing and branding of an effective offer, and the offer itself has to reflect the different needs of the markets, different start points, different delivery models, etc., is that ultimately you will not be able to use up the facility if the quality of your provision, your reputation is not good. And the dynamic is different. Fee paying learners are, loan funded learners are fee paying learners. They, they see themselves in that way. And therefore the criticality of engagement, retention, checking out how satisfied they are is critical, as well as obviously Ofsted's expectations of teaching, learning assessment and support. And for me, what really has been the, the main factor here is that every time we have an opportunity to interact with a learner, we have an impact on them. And a lot of our learners uh, uh, at Learning Curve and at, uh, at the college I'm a governor of, as well as the other training provider, have actually progressed from some of our uh, level three certificates to other programs at level three. Some have taken out two loans, I think the most we've got is three loans, but also they're looking for higher level qualifications. And that's another particular area of frustration at the moment is that we've, in some areas, we just don't have enough uh, level four and five provision for progression. A lot of our learners therefore have said, well, I've really enjoyed work. I love what you're doing. It's great. I've, I've personally gained in all kinds of ways. Um, and we've got to be able to offer them something, I think, particularly at level four and above.
And I don't know if you've similarly got, similarly got frustration. I know some of you have said there isn't enough in your area at level four, five, and six. And that's obviously an agenda for the awarding bodies to address. But obviously, your terms and conditions of which a person is, is undertaking a study, the theory of litigation, if, for example, you don't deliver the quality, as well as the bad press that we've had around loan funded providers that have gone out of business. And that obviously got implications for brand reputation. So I link all of those together. Having an appropriate offer, marketing it and promoting it effectively, having a clear brand proposition to make, and then making sure the actual experience highlights and emphasizes the reputation that you've got. I think that's absolutely critical. And the rules and, and you know regulations apart, I think those still leave us with some, I think, uh, some concerns. I think the concerns is that there has been some uh, restriction now on the growth that occurred in the past. I think as long as you've got evidence of demand, and certainly you've got waiting lists, um, and as I said, the next uh, uh, growth request point is uh, is the 23rd of March, the 6th of April. If you're wanting, uh, if you're wanting to go for less than 250,000 pound growth, then you don't have to prove that you've got the capacity and capability. But there are limits, and those limits obviously are quite critical. It's a maximum of 750,000 or 50% of your 2017-18 loans facilities allowed, whichever is lower. So you know that's just the loans facility. I think some providers have not been able to meet demand, uh, and that's from what some of you have said already. You know, you've got your waiting list, and that's frustrating. I think there's been some concern over the cost of quality, some inadequate provision. We've had some disasters and on that front, but also, you know, that those learners are then left high and dry without a provider, and yet still have to repay the loan. I think we we've got certain conditions to change. I think um, I think from that we're starting to see three key things coming through. The first, I think, is subcontracting, which I think is a good question. Will that be perhaps uh, allowed again? Secondly, if a learner uh, is is a uh, provider goes out of business, I I think the learner should not be required to repay the loan, uh, particularly if there's not a suitable alternative provider. I think that's just not uh, it's just not good uh, customer relations. And I think thirdly, we will want to see what if what happens if the threshold is increased to two hundred fifty uh, to twenty five thousand uh, pounds from the current twenty one thousand. But I think you'll see that uh, with all of those sort of concerns. There are still uh, potential opportunities and great opportunities for you to uh, to use up your loans facility. Um, I know from some of you, you have already said that the frustration is that you would have been able to use it up if you had a, uh, uh, was still able to use a subcontracting partner. Of course, some of you were formerly subcontractors, and now you're um, you're uh, delivering in your own right. You've gone through the ROTO, and you're seeing opportunities to 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 grow. That's good on you. I think that's that's excellent news. But I think it's it's, it's just about making sure that uh, everything we do is compliant with those rules and regulations. And where there's a need for them to be clarified, I think we we really need that to be a case. My my feeling on subcontracting is I think we've got to have a, another look at it. I know it's going to be more difficult. Uh, to go back on a, a policy decision, but I think it was a, a good way of activating new learners. And not all the providers who were previously were subcontractors do want to become primes, haven't got the capacity necessary to, to be involved. But I do think that if you're willing to undertake a good, robust quality assurance, run your own management information system, then you know why not go for it? And certainly that's what we've done. Uh, 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 as private training providers, and we're seeing the benefits of it now. The the other frustration certainly is coming through, and Paul, you reflected that is is uh, it's it's you know we might be putting a lot of energy into ways of of coming up with alternative models, and then the frustration is that that might not be might not pass uh, any of the uh, uh, conditions laid down by the funders, the auditors, or or legally. Um, any other questions or comments before we? Stop the recording. I think we've asked most, answered most of the, with the well, we've tried to answer most of the questions. Uh, I'm just looking back through the Marek. I think we have, I think we have covered off, um, I think we've covered off everything. Have we missed anything? Uh, let's put it back out there. Have we missed any of your questions that you put through that we uh, we either didn't answer fully or we, or we uh, missed altogether? 
If so, just like one, yeah, 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 go on then. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I think one bit of advice is also make sure you just have a look at the one of you particularly have the rule. Have a look at the what the the most recent rules say about uh, breaks in learning. Um, and I think the other one is yeah, we had that. That was from Sally. Thank you. Uh, we looked about subcontracting. Uh, I'm trying to look at the oh yes. Um, yeah, I mean it's frustrating if you haven't got a contract. Um, I mean, you know, you've been chosen, uh, and it's frustrating. Um, obviously, one bit of advice is is if you feel it might be appropriate to become funded directly, uh, and are looking for contract values of more than a hundred thousand pounds, I would certainly look at going on to the ROTA or ROTO and becoming a learn a provider in your own right. I know that's going to bring other attendant issues, but uh, it, it is frustrating uh, until we get a clarification on that. We've mentioned the difference uh, of, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the questions is that you have to, I mean, the best, if you've got a waiting list, um, then I think bring it back to the All Ages Careers and Information Service, assuming that they're active, uh, and say, look, these are the learners that uh, have requested to come on a program and they wish uh, to undertake a program and they want to take out a loan. And uh, but it, I know it means that, you know, you've done all the hard work to market it, to, to become to promote it and you're moving it on to other learners. But I think that's frustrating, certainly. I think is there a list of alternative providers available? I don't think that, I mean, I can't imagine there would be because basically that's something that the, the, the providers should be identified independently and then obviously, but you might direct them to uh, someone that you might know and say they're a good quality provider, go and apply to them. Uh, that's if you know them. But uh, again, it's it's really the, the role of the independent information uh, and careers uh, service for adults to do that if it's if it's got all the information and that information is is available um, uh, as long as that uh, as long as that uh, information is up to date and uh, current okay Manic, if we just close the recording down at this point let's thank everyone for the questions